everyone. I hope you can now hear me. I can hear you, Izumi. Great, uh, thanks. So we'll just uh, wait for a few more minutes until um, others join. So uh, let's give it an uh, additional minute or two. And um, if you don't mind, Herman um, or uh, Loriana, would you be able to send a reminder to the team list that the call is happening and um, so the, the members are welcome to join the call? I'm doing, I'm doing that right now. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, although the um the Curse team members who are joining today is um, not that many, um, I, I'd like to start. Um, and then hopefully while we do the agenda bashing, um, there may be more members are joining. So welcome to all the team members as well as the observers. And um, so as I circulated the agenda at the um, at the call, um, we'll start with the action items as usual. Um, so I'd like to confirm the status of the minutes of the um, the previous calls, and then I'd also like to follow up on the quick review of the SLA version three. And there are a few updates that uh, it might be worth sharing. Our uh, first is IGF 2015, which happened two weeks ago in Brazil. Uh, there was also a right meeting um, last week, and I understand there was a session on the IANA stewardship transition. And then I haven't actually added this in the update, but it might be worth also sharing a very broad um, update around the CCWG accountability because it affects our timelines. And then um, on the fourth point on the agenda, I'd like to cover the implementation status of the three components of a proposal, which is the review committee, SLA, uh, and lastly on the IPR. And, um, and so that's the suggested agenda. And uh, let's see if there's anything else that people would like to uh, discuss at the call today. Um, I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so let's start with the actions review and um, the minutes from the past meeting. 
Would uh, someone from the NRO Secretariat be able to give us an update? Apologies, in Sumi, they will be very shortly. Okay, um, noted. Um, and um, so um, let me double check uh, what are the ones that uh, we're waiting for. So we're waiting for the minutes from the last call. And anything else that uh, needs, um, needs more work or up, um, to be posted? I'm looking at the Chris team archives, and I, it seems that um, from meeting 27th, the notes are missing. I'll take a look at that. Okay, thanks, uh, Loriana, for this uh, follow up. Um, so I think that just stages around a minute. Um, then uh, let's go to another action item, which is the action item on the Chris team members um, to share our views on SLA version 3. I, I think immediately after the last team call, I did observe a few members um, sharing an observation that it's uh, consistent with um, the SLA principle. Um, and I felt that it might be worth um, giving a little bit more detailed observations than uh, simply broadly saying that it's, uh, it's consistent. So I actually circulated uh, my observation a few hours ago um, per each section of the um, of the version three SLA, which I observed some track changes. And um, in, in general, I, I think it was uh, very uh, well um, reflecting the feedback. And I didn't have anything that would be um, strong concern. Um, especially, I think it's quite important that Article 9, failure to perform, and Article 10, term and termination, is um, adequately um, reflected. I didn't see any changes from version 2. So I think that means that we're, um, we're, we're comfortable with this, um, with this section. And most of the parts that were changed are either for better clarity in terms of the language. Um, in, in the section that has uh, uh, quite substantial changes are Article um, 2, Article 6, or 7, and, and I think 8, 11. So, um, but on Article 2, it's, it's basically um, defining um, the, the separation of policy development and operational roles. And um, so I didn't really observe any strong concerns. It's basically providing better clarity. And then there was a section about um, Article 4, distribution of services provided to RIRs, um, which I think it's basically a matter of agreement between the IANA function operator and RIR. And this level of details is not defined by the SLA principles. So I don't think the Chris team is in a position to say whether certain um, details of the services or operations should be done in a particular way. I think that's the decision between the RIR and, um, and the IANA function operator. Um, and at the same time, I didn't observe anything that is not consistent with the SLA principle. Uh, one thing that might be worth noting um, in this Article 4, which is Section 4.4, .4, registry data. Uh, I think it's important to make sure that um, registry data is adequately managed and preserved. Um, but this addition is, again, consistent with the SLA principles, and it's quite helpful to have this addition. So I, I felt that we can actually proactively support this change. Um, and then there are two points that I actually had um, questions, uh, which is Article 8, uh, review of IANA numbering services. 
And of course, this section is important and relevant to the SLA principles and making sure that um, the services provided meets the needs of the RIRs and the wider community. And um, oh, sorry, so article. So that that is a correct observation about the article, but this is well articulated and it's referred to Article Six. So I have no concerns. I think the point that I wanted to raise questions are, are Articles 11 and 12. One is 11 is about continuity of operations. Um, and one point that sort of got my attention was it seems to have a weaker obligation to the operator, which says um, operator agrees to exercise best efforts and cooperation. So the word best efforts and cooperation is being put instead of um, a language in version 2 which seems to be more stronger in requiring the operator um, to uh, orderly and efficient transition to a successful operator. Um, I'm sure that there were good reasons around it, but it would be good to understand why um, why this uh, change was made and uh, whether we feel that it's possible to maintain the stability of the operation at the event of changing the operator uh, with this language that we actually simply require the existing operator to make best efforts in cooperation uh, to, at the time of the transition to a successful operator. So that's one, one observation. And the second observation is around Article 12, which is around intellectual property rights and rights over data. Um, so, I think again, this is trying to provide more clarity um, around any property rights that would arise as a result of the Anna Function operator providing the service. I, I wasn't very sure whether this would um, allow the RIRs, even if the, the Anna Function operator keeps certain rights around the service. It's still possible for the RIRs to change the operator and then be able to ask this uh, new operator to or to provide this uh, service, despite having this um, intellectual uh, acknowledging any intellectual property rights uh, by the Anna function operator, which may arise as a result of the service. Uh, I'm I'm not an expert. I don't know if my reading of these uh, clauses. Um, are correct. And um, so, okay, I see that Michael is still struggling to, to join. So, um, maybe it would be better to bring these points up uh, to when Michael is able to join uh, so that he can clarify. So, maybe we can. Yeah, he's, um, trying to restart his, he's trying to restart his computer to see if that'll help. Okay, thank you. Noted, John. Um, thanks for this update. So maybe we can now move to another point in the agenda, uh, which is uh, updates from first the IGF Brazil and then uh, from the right meeting, which took place last week. Um, um, there were two sessions around the IANA uh, stewardship transition uh, during the IGF. One is the review about the, um, the effectiveness of the process itself, and the second is about remaining issues around the, um, the transition. I wouldn't um, say there was anything that's uh, especially notable from our perspective. So um, on the process, I'm hearing some noise. I don't know. Um, yeah, thank you. I think it's, it's quiet now. Um, and then on the process, one of the things that's notable is that there was some one participant uh, noted that maybe there weren't sufficient input uh, in terms of regional balance, especially from the developing countries. And uh, so there wasn't like a concrete comment on whether that's good or bad, but it was simply an observation made. And um, so that's something that got my attention. Um, Having said that, overall, I think the ICG had 
Not so bad regional balance. Of course, certain regions were more vocal than the other. But um, and then if we focus especially on the the numbers community, um, since each of the RIR regions actually had face-to-face um, -face meetings, um, we, we actually have quite a region, good regional, reasonable regional balance in terms of the input that we've received um, from our respective communities, not judging simply from the comments being submitted to, uh, to the ICG. And indeed, um, there was a participant from the African region who explicitly expressed that um, having Afrenic, having these updates at this um, Afrenic meeting around the IANA um, topic was very helpful. Uh, so I think that was a positive input uh, from our perspective. Um, and then in terms of the contents of the, um, the remaining issues on the IANA, which, is, which was a separate panel around, um, around this topic, from the um, session on the process. Um, there was a lot of uh, comments around um, remaining in the US jurisdiction and also um, around what's called stress test 18, which is not directly relevant to, um, to the ICG proposal, but it's around ICANN accountability proposal on um, how much the government can actually provide advice to ICANN board. So it's, it's, uh, it's more political discussions than um, the specifics of the proposal itself. Um, that was the point that actually had most uh, tractions and discussions. But again, I don't think there's any additional input or any action needed from our perspective. So that's how the sessions um, in Brazil was. You can actually see them on um, the video, and I think you can also hear the, the, the video. You can hear the voices, and the transcript should be available um, soon as well. I see hand from the Rani. Sorry, that was an old hand about the SLA, so we can wait um, maybe until we go back and discuss that. Oh, right. Sorry, I didn't realize earlier. So um, let's see if there's any comments. Um, yeah, can, I can hear you, um, Loriana. Yeah, I can hear. I could hear Nulani. I haven't heard you speak, Loriana, but yeah, I'm hearing the audio. Um, let's see if there are any comments or questions around there. And if I don't see any hands, then let's go to the update from the break meeting. Okay, I'll jump in and give an update from the right meeting. Um, well, we had a, um, a session uh, where we um, presented the, just gave an update of the fixed work and then also uh, yeah, the WG. Um, and uh, I was actually very happy to see that we had a very uh, good and lively discussion. I thought by now people would be uh, <laughs> the IANA transition uh, discussions, but it was actually very good to see. Uh, there was nothing controversial that came up. There were a few good questions, I thought. There were certainly questions about the number community priorities. I should also actually say that we all, the whole team, again, received uh, very good praise from some prominent members in the community and saying that they've been very happy with the proposal and the work we've done after that. So that was very encouraging to see that we are we still have the support from our community. We've not um, uh, none of the actions we've taken since the proposal seems to have um, gone against any of the community um, views. Uh, there were some good questions about the need for the, the transition and the the consequences of the the transition. Um, where we had questions about um, given that the the CCWG work. Uh, it's risking delay the transition, uh, what that means for, for the number community. And, and um, there were some clarifications both by us and then also by some, some people in the community that really operationally the transition will have um, minimal impact. It really won't affect um, the, the um, operators or other members of the number community. 
uh, and really in essence it's, it's given that we've also we will continue with ICANN as the the um, IANA service numbering services provider it will have very little practical um, impact but of course that from a broader internet governance perspective and as supporters of the, the multi stakeholder model this is an important step and but it was also good to hear reflections from members of the community saying that they felt that in the number community we have already proven in this process that that the RIR structures the bottom up transparent inclusive um, pro multi stakeholder processes work and and that the work that we've done in in uh, the number community as part of the IANA stewardship transition sort of was a testament to that so that was very encouraging to hear I think that was it I don't know if Andre has anything to to add no I don't have anything to add I think uh, you covered it all Narania thank you Thank you very much, Nori. I think that's really positive to hear that um, there was interest and also support from the community. So thanks for this um, update. Um, and then I'll then give a very brief update about the status of ICANN accountability um, discussions. We don't necessarily want to discuss each of the um, issues that have been discussed in the accountability, but um, maybe just briefly sharing what the controversial issues are to give you an idea of the status. So first, I think our most you know, strongest interest is the timeline. Um, and at this stage, um, the chairs are being um, very firm about keeping up with the, the suggested timeline. And the, the end goal is that uh, by 22nd of January next year, um, the CCWG will make a submission to ICANN board um, on its final proposal that actually goes through the, um, the approval of each of the supporting organizations. That's the process that's needed in any of the, uh, the working group within the ICANN. So that's something that, that is good at this stage. Um, at the same time, I'm constantly observing um, strong pressure within uh, several members of the DPWG to extend the timelines. Um, and the reason for it, for it is that even at this stage, there are a few issues that the CCWG hasn't yet um, arrived to consensus. And so the a, um, from the position from the numbers community, of course, we're, we're pushing to, um, we're, we're encouraging to, uh, for the CCWG to meet the timelines. Um, at the same time, we are not um, keeping, I think that simply just asking them to, um, you know, say, hey, we should stick with the timeline. They've already heard enough and the chairs know enough about it. So what we're trying to do is, you know, show an example that, okay, ASO will be able to keep up with the timelines and try to create an encouraging vibe. And another thing we're trying to do is um, join the discussions on the controversial issues. So um, so hopefully CCWG would be able to reach an agreement. Um, one of the um, most controversial issues is around stress test 18, which is what I mentioned earlier. This is basically um, a way to ensure that the ability for the, um, the government advisory um, council within ICANN, which is called the GAC, um, keeps the same threshold of strength, the ability to advise the board. So it doesn't increase um, the, the GAC's ability to influence the board more than it, it, um, it does today. That was considered important um, to give assurance to especially the US Congress that um, without, even without the NTIS stewardship, um, the level of influence by um, the government group remains the same. Uh, this actually um, added concerns within uh, several GAC members that um, 
they may not necessarily want to strengthen the influence, but they also want to have the ability to define the consensus in the way they want. So it's taken as a restriction um, by the CCWG to the GAC on how they want to define, define consensus, and they might want to lower the level of uh, consensus in the future. Uh, but this, uh, having this, um, this what's called stress test 18 and having this requirement put into the bylaw uh, is perceived as making it more difficult for the GAP members to, to make changes in the future about, um, about the level of consensus, how, how they define the level of, cons level of consensus. So I guess even if we want to push for the timelines, unless there's an agreement uh, within the CCWG on this issue, it's it just uh, a word would sound a bit, you know, hollow. That's, um, you know, we just sound as though we're trying to move things without a clear issue not being resolved. So that's um, one of the challenges that the CCWG is facing. But at the same time, as I said earlier, um, Currently, we're, we're sticking with the timeline, and so we just um, need to keep an eye and, uh, yeah, um, the ASO liaisons are collaborating with the NLEC on how we can contribute to new discussions within the CCWG in a positive way. So that's uh, a very brief update, um, and um, without going into opinions about a particular issue or direction, if people have any questions about uh, um, the status of the CCWG or any suggestions about what might make it easier for CCWG to move forward, um, yeah, I, I welcome any observations. I see no hand, and uh, thanks, John, for this update that uh, Michael is now on the phone. Excellent, Michael, and thank you so much for joining. Um, I also see um, Wendua have joined as well, so welcome, Wendua. So let, let, let's now um, go back to um, the SLA um, version 3. Um, so, Michael, I have a question about um, two Two points. That's um, two, two, two of the articles uh, within the third version of the SLA, and uh, it would be helpful if you can clarify the reason for these changes. So one is Article 11, and the second is Article 12. So first, um, move to Article 11, continuity of operations. So um, when I compare what's being stated in version uh, 2 of the SLA, version 3 seems to have weaker obligation to the operator um, when uh, we actually try to change the IANA function operator to a successor. So it says the operator agrees to exercise best efforts and cooperation to affect an orderly and efficient transition to a successful operator. So it doesn't make it a requirement that they actually help in efficient transition to a successful operator, but you know, we, we actually reword it um, in terms of the best effort. I assume that that was for some pragmatic reason, um, but I just want to clarify the reason behind it and also a confirmation that this actually still allows us to maintain the stability of the operation at the time of changing the IANA function operator. Yes, thank you, Jimmy, and uh, apologies to everybody for uh, my delay and having some technical difficulties. It was a flashback to our first crisp call, I think. But um, so with regard to the, to the change that you referenced, um, that was a discussion that, that we had and some feedback that we got um, because uh, I guess the, the prior language, and I don't have the prior language in front of me, but it was more of a, a stronger kind of commitment, right? And I know that uh, the concern here was why did we lessen um, the, the strength of that language because exercise best efforts does not uh, seem like a strict obligation. But the reason why we did this 
is it is still an obligation on their part to exercise their best, best efforts to affect a transition because um, with regard to a transition, there are multiple parties involved, right? There's obviously the RIRs and the operator, at this, in this instance, ICANN, but let's uh, take, for example, if we were to go to a, uh, another party to be the operator and we had to do a transition. Um, you know, in this contract, it is, it is between or among the RIRs and uh, ICANN. Um, when we bring in a third party, we can't, I guess we can't say it has to be an orderly transition because that involves also a third party. And um, in, in kind of a reasonable and fairness uh, perspective to who the current operator would be, um, you know, they can cooperate all they can, but if the other operator, which, you know, is a very, um, I guess, remote possibility, but let's say the third, third party, the new operator, would not be cooperative with the current one with ICANN, then, you know, there's this kind of issue of, well, what if ICANN is doing everything they can um, to cooperate, but the other side isn't? So to kind of strike a balance, but still have a requirement on the operator to be a part of a transition, that they can't just drop everything, that they actually have to take part, exercise their best efforts, um, and, and work towards an orderly transition, um, that's why that language was um, was modified, is that it was, it was taking into account the idea that there is um, a third party that would be involved outside of the contract and uh, understanding that uh, ICANN, in this instance, the operator, would not be able to control the level of cooperation they're working with of the third party. Uh, this seems to strike the balance that we need, that as a community, we still need them to commit to be part of an orderly transition because of the importance of the function. However, um, also understanding that a third party, we can't have any control in this contract, doesn't control the third party. So I hope that, that clarifies why that we made that change and happy to answer any more questions you may have. All right. I was just typing in the chat that I'm, I, I, I withdraw my hand. I think Michael explained it well, uh, and I agree with that. I think uh, you can't require one party to ensure an orderly transition when they don't have control of all the parts. So um, I think I, I certainly understand that rewriting, and I think it's um, still in, in, um, in compliance with the, um, the proposal. And just as a general comment, uh, I've, I've, I've read it through to the chain. I cannot see um, anything that is um, inconsistent with the proposal. So I'd be happy to go ahead and say that we, we um, um, that we uh, endorse the changes. And I and also really like some of the, uh, the the new language, which is a little bit clearer than than uh, in draft two. So. Um, I'm, I'm from a Chris perspective, I'm happy. Thanks. Thanks, Nurani, uh, for um, sharing this observation and also for the overall observation that um, you're, you're happy with the, the third version. So, yeah, um, I also feel the same uh, going through each of the detections. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't want to hold up too much time around this, um, but I think on Article 12, I, I do want to have a one clarification around intellectual property rights and rights over data. That um, so it doesn't actually, while well acknowledging the rights of the, the existing operator, that certain rights might arise as a result of the services that it provides. Uh, it doesn't actually hinder RIR's ability to change the INR function operator due to the fact that um, the existing operator might hold certain rights. Um, which arise as a result of the service. Would, would this be a fair assumption? Yes, it is. Um, so with regard to the modifications to Article 12, um, we didn't, you know, we didn't want to do anything that would uh, hinder a, a transition and, and if we were to move to a new operator, but also recognizing that, um, you know, the most important piece of all this is, is the um, the records, you know, the data, the historical information, you know, correspondence, things like that. And um, 
acknowledging that an operator, whether it be ICANN or any operator, may um, create certain intellectual property rights in their internal systems, for example, that um, some proprietary uh, works that um, may be helpful for them in terms of how they manage and perform the function, but that the community's uh, interest is really in just making sure that we have the data, the historical information, you know, all of those things, but not the, you know, proprietary internal stuff that an operator may develop. So for this, um, we were very clear to make sure that, okay, um, you know, an operator may create these intellectual property rights and maintain their intellectual property rights in any of these systems or um, works that they have. However, um, the, ca the caveat for that is any of the, um, you know, records, metadata, you know, historical information, correspondence had to be maintained in a non-proprietary format and, um, and that they don't have any rights in the data and the information. And that, that for us uh, was a good, uh, another good balance to strike in that Let's, let's take, for example, we do have a, another operator coming in. Um, you know, they're going to perform the function in the way that they deem the best way to perform the function in accordance with whatever SLA that we uh, enter into with them. But what they really need is the data. What they really need is the information. So, um, so the two things that we, we wanted to acknowledge was that true an operator could create some uh, you know, intellectual property rights in performance, but that nothing would be, um, they would have no rights with regard to data and information, the key stuff that we need so that, and it's in a non-proprietary format, so that when a new operator were to come in, that's an orderly transition, they can have access to that data immediately. There's no need for, you know, licensing of software or anything like that. So, um, so with regard to your assumption that it's correct, this does not impact on, um, on a transition to a new operator, it doesn't hinder it in any way. Thank you so much, Michael. I think that's very helpful. And I also find it um, helpful that we actually have better clarity on this point. And it's actually, I, I've actually reconfirmed my understanding that these clauses actually uh, helps us to uh, give more flexibility um, in moving the um, IANA function operator if at all needed in the future. Um, by, by adding these uh, clauses. So thank you very much. Um, so I think um, we've actually um, covered anything that needs to be highlighted in terms of the changes um, in SLA version 3. Um, so unless anybody else have any other observations, uh, I'd like to move to our agenda point number four and then maybe I'll first discuss about um, the SLA part and how we can actually share our observation to the, to the community. So I'm not seeing any hands. Um, so I think it would be good for us to give an explicit endorsement and support for SLA or version, oh, I see hands from did I see it? That's a new hand, Lonnie? Yes, but I uh, certainly didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I'm, I'm, if you want um, okay. to finish, I'll, I'll give my comments after that. Okay, sure. Okay. Um, yes, so I think it, it would be good to have an explicit um, endorsement from the Chris team um, that we actually find this, um, this version consistent with the number community. And I think um, rather than just giving it a, it a broad uh, endorsement, it might be nice to share observations on the point that um, we felt was important, but we actually thought that this was helpful. Um, if this can also be done. So maybe we can um, give it um, by the end of this week uh, within the Chris team uh, mailing list based on the observations that I've circulated. And then we can actually add like a, a broad um, summary that we actually uh, consider this uh, change to be helpful 
um, and we actually support the third version as something that's consistent in terms of um, the SLA principles and in, in the broader sense, the number community proposal. So that's my suggestion about how we uh, move forward in terms of the, the SLA. Um, let's see if any other um, comments about this, um, if people have any other suggestions. And then in the meantime, uh, let's go to Nurani. Thanks. Well, my comment was on that, and I, and I agree with your approach. I think um, I think we can make a general comment about I don't necessarily about the parts where we think um, that there were changes, there were simply clarifications or improvement of language. I don't think we necessarily need to point to every part of of uh, that because I think that would also potentially give the impression that this is all open for discussion. So. My suggestion would be that we make a general comment about that we see that there have been several changes where the, um, in order to clarify the language uh, and that um, we could possibly bring up these two things that we've discussed on this call um, very briefly to, and, and to, to say that there were clarifications made and we, we believe that it's consistent uh, and that we in general uh, in reading the whole SLA version 3, we feel that it is consistent with the proposal. Um, so that's a suggestion of, of um, yeah, from my side. Thanks, Nirani. I, I think that's a very good idea and, and I support it. And um, to maybe, um, in addition, maybe it might be good to also highlight that um, in terms of terms and termination and um, and I forgot what else I added. I think another point that we felt was important was failure to perform. I think these points, there were no changes made, and, and we're very happy to see that this, is, this continues to be consistent um, with, um, with the number of community proposals. So I, I think I, I very much agree with the approach that you suggested. Let's see if people have any other comments. Okay, I'm not seeing um, any hands, so I suggested. Um, so um, we'll we'll circulate the draft um, to the Chris team mailing list, and uh, we want to finalize it by the end of this week, um, and then we can circulate this on the IANA Expo list um, by Monday. Okay, so I think that's around the SLA, and um, I don't know if um, Michael or anyone else um, have any anything else to add around the SLA in terms of the broader timelines or the, the direction. I observe that there's already been a comment from ICANN on the third version of the SLA, so I trust that um, based on that, um, the IIR legal team will be incorporating those comments and then produce another version. Let's see if there's anything else to be added. Yes, Suzanne, that's, that's correct. We did, um, we did get the comment from ICANN uh, very recently. So I don't have the hard uh, date on that, but um, I do want to assure everybody on the call and, and I guess the community as well that uh, you know, we received these comments and um, the, from the RIR side, we are reviewing it uh, very quickly and, um, you know, we'll be coordinating with each other to, to look at these changes. And, um, and I assume that uh, I personally even haven't had a chance to, to look at it as in as much time as I'd like to. So um, I'm going to be doing that even today. And, uh, you know, we'll be coming up with a new version or a new, a, um, a, uh, a new version to release to the community after some discussions with amongst the RARs and with ICANN. So, um, so you know, we did we did get those comments, and we're we're very uh, pleased to get those, and um, you know, excited to be able to hopefully bring this uh, closer to resolution. Thanks, Michael. And I find this process to be very transparent, and I, I think this is a very good. Um, that we are actually able to see the interaction between the RIRs and ICANN. Um, so, um, 
Then let's move to the review committee charter. So I, I know that um, the, the updated version of the review committee charter is uh, available on the NRO uh, website. And I think we've, we're done with um, calling for comments from the community. Well, that's my understanding. And I think we want to be moving now to the phase of um, calling for but within each of the RIR region about the members of the um, of the review committee. So um, let's see if there are any updates from um, any of the region around the selection of the members. I I, I assume right community might have some updates. About the selection of the members, um, I understand. Hello. Hello. I, I sorry. I, I, the audio is a little bit bad. Were you asking if the right community had an update on the review team? Yes, about the review team selection. Right. Yes, it was uh, confirmed at the right meeting. As I mentioned before, there was a suggestion that the um, NRONC uh, basically um, preliminary fills the role of the review team so that there is a team in place. Uh, and that was um, confirmed at the last right meeting. Um, so there's been a decision about that. I should perhaps also, just for, for the sake of transparency, um, also tell this group that I was uh, elected onto the NRO NC for the right region uh, at the last right meeting, and I will start my term in January, just, so, just for the sake of transparency. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's, it's excellent news. Um, and. Um, so thanks for this uh, update, and yes, congratulations, Nurani. And um, so, are there any um, updates from any other regions around the selection of the review committee? Hello, hello. Can I talk? John Vier. Yes. Hello. Thank you. Okay, uh, I want to say that uh, about uh, uh, we, we have afternoon in the afternoon region we we have our policy meeting um, uh, that uh, it show is scheduled uh, on 28 uh, 28 uh, November to 4th December and uh, during that uh, policy meeting we we have um, we have to appoint the appoint the member of um, the review committee for piano number services so uh, we plan to appoint um, the to appoint the the member uh, of that uh, committee during uh, that meeting next week excellent news on uh, john VA, and that's mm -hmm. that's very helpful to confirm um Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Ernest Afrenix. Uh, I would just like to add a little bit to what Jean Vier has said. Uh, there has been some rough consensus towards uh, actually having the two S or AC representatives be appointed into those positions. Uh, it's, uh, the discussion is still uh, on the list, but there has not been any opposition to that proposal. So it is likely that, yes, that uh, in Congo, those that will be appointed will most likely be the current ASOAC representatives. Just to add to our young years, uh, comment. Mm, that's very um, useful to know. So um, Afrinic region, while not fixed yet, uh, is considering to take similar approach as the right um, region. So thank you for this update. Um, from the APNIC region, I, there's not been any discussions, and our next meeting is um, next year, uh, the end of February. So I'm aware that the EC knows about this and thinks that um, they, they need to select members. Um, so I'll follow up again um, about the status.
Any other update from other regions? If not, um, let's um, then uh, go to the last point around the implementation, which is around the, the IPR um, on the IANA trademark and IANA .org domain name. So actually, Rani and I just joined the pool with um, the, the chairs of the CWG and the IETF leaders about this issue. And um, it, it was basically uh, more about information and sharing. And we also tried to discuss about a way forward. Um, first, um, the, um, the update. The CWG has um, set up a team dedicated to discuss this issue. And this is led by uh, Greg Shatton. Um, and I think they're developing um, draft on some of the requirements and asking questions. I actually circulated and shared this on the Christine uh, mailing list. Also, the CWG chairs have mentioned that um, they're also conscious about um, the need to work in a timely manner. Uh, and one of the issues, in addition to their comments on the principles that um, that's identified by the CRISP team, uh, one issue which might be new is around um, the financing. So how should financing uh, be accommodated by the, the holder of the, um, of the trademark? At this meeting, um, um, Yari has uh, clarified that in case that um, the IHS Trust will be the holder of this, um, this trade, uh, this right, in that case, the IHS Trust can um, accommodate um, this financing aspect. But um, we haven't discussed further uh, about this, and it was just raised as a possible area that needs uh, that might need more clarity. Uh, we also tried to discuss about whether we can have an agreement about the key dates, uh, what to work on, on the, the steps of work that's needed um, until the implementation is completed. So first. Um, agree on the principles and the framework. Um, so that's on the um, on the the first stage. So that's more of the conceptual uh, agreement on the conceptual and the broad framework. And then I'll um, move to the second stage where we actually start working on the implementation. Whether that's about um, developing the contract between the three operational communities, or in case that um, there's no agreement to, um, to for the IHS Trust uh, to hold the mark, and we need to set up a new um, entity. Uh, this, is, this will be another um, procedure that's needed. But that's more the, of the details of the implementation. So we expect that in the second phase, we would need uh, more expertise um, from, the, from our perspective, the legal team um, and lawyers. Uh, on the first phase, it's more about uh, confirming whether the principles or the framework that we agree is consistent with the proposal that's developed by the number community and ultimately uh, by the ICG. So those are the, the very broad stages that um, all the leaders from the three operational communities felt was a, was a good uh, way to consider it. Um, in terms of the specifics of when we agree on the principles, the framework, and then on the, the implementation stage, we haven't yet reached an agreement. Uh, and it was also felt that since this call is uh, more on informational sharing, it might be a bit too much uh, to, um, to just decide on the timelines the call that we had, and then share this with the um, with each of our communities. Having said that, this was recognized as something that um, needs to be worked on. So this is still on the, the agenda for the continued uh, work. Um, and another issue is that 
since the CWG uh, has uh, started discussing some of the details, which may be more detailed than what we've identified in terms of the principle, how do we actually be in sync about the, how far we actually go and the stages of work um, and how we actually make sure we, we communicate and perhaps um, in future steps um, have a, a maybe stronger way of collaboration rather than just simply uh, information sharing. So these are the points that we actually um, discussed at the call. Um, as the next step, um, we'll be discussing um, what we, we have actually felt that the participants at the call felt that we, we agreed, and then we'll be circulating um, as a, the current stages and a way forward uh, to each of the communities. So we'll be circulating um, this uh, to the CRISP team as well. Um, Milani, is there anything else that you want to add? If not, um, let's see if there are any comments or questions about um, this status. Andre. Okay, I, I see your question. Thank you, Andre. Um, I hope you're all, all able to hear me. So, well, the agreement is, um, it was just an example that I've raised, and we didn't really go into the details of, um, of agreement or whether we actually go for another framework. I just mentioned it because it was something that was put on the table by the IANA uh, plan working group. And we actually uh, uh, express support as the CRISP team that um, this would be something that would be consistent with the, the principles that we've developed uh, in the number community. So that was just an example, and we didn't really um, discuss um, any details of it. And it's nothing new from, um, from the INF plan working group idea. Any other comments or questions? Okay, um, no tip, Narani. And I think we've actually covered um, all the points in the agenda. Um, so thank you. Um, let's first, um, lastly, confirm if there's any other points that people would like to raise. And I'm not seeing any hands. So um, thank you, everyone, for um, joining the call. Um, and may I confirm with um, someone from the NRO Secretariat when the date of the, the next call is? Give me just a se uh, second, um, checking that.
Uh, Isumi? Yes. The next call would be on December 10th. December uh, the 10th. Uh, the Thursday, yes. Thursday, okay. December 10th. Okay, thank you. So let's uh, mark this on our calendar and then maybe in the future we might want to consider about the frequency of the call. So we'll see how much agenda that we'll have. And, but then we'll, let's keep December 10th as the next call for now. And um, so we'll keep in touch online, especially on the, um, the SLA version to comments. Thanks everyone for joining and have a nice rest of the day.